Hey everybody, welcome to another piece of ash with Ash. Um, this is my monthly sit and talk show where I basically do a Q&A. You guys can ask me questions um, and basically get me to talk about whatever. Usually to do with Wargaming, um, Girl Miniature Games, or myself. Uh, basically what I do is I go through the questions on SurveyMonkey um, one at a time. I go for about an hour and if I go you know, over an hour, then unfortunately it's cut short. So if you want to ask me a question, this is going to be June's show. If you want to ask me a question for July, click the link right now in the description for this video. Go to Surrey Monkey um, and get your question right away because the earlier the questions come in, the more likely I am to get to them in queue. And if you don't get me to um, get a question you asked last month, just hit me up again and hopefully I'll get to it next time. So yeah, let's get started. Um, today, I'm gonna do the same thing I did last time and I'm actually doing my sit and talk from my workbench and that means that I'll be working on some models while I chat with you guys. Uh, today's models are, I should be painting instead of building. Um, last time I did this, you saw me building a Neverborn starter set, uh, Dark Debts with Jacob Lynch from Malifaux. Um, and I still have some alpha stuff on my painting bench. I'm trying to clear off because I'm trying to move on to uh, my next project. Uh, and that is three Waldgeists, or little tree guys for the Neverborn. Um, three Depleted, who are like basically brilliance junkies from Alpha that are not doing so good. They've grown tentacles and their bodies are all busted up. Um, and then Mr. Tannen, who's like the greasy old man basically doing card tricks down at uh, the Honey Pot, which is Jacob Lynch's bar. So I'm gonna try and finish painting them. Their base coats are down, I've washed them. I've got the base all finished for the most part. I just need to do some details. So I'm gonna paint while I answer your questions. Hope you guys enjoy this uh, and we will, yeah, hopefully get as far as we can. So Thomas P. asks, I'm starting to get into Mordheim and want my friends to get into it too. What would be the best way of getting them interested? Also, could you do more Mordheim videos? I love the stuff you did at Mini Wargaming. I really wanna do more Mordheim videos. Um, I'm gonna ask to answer the question, second question first. Uh, the problem with that is, I'd like to do it with nice terrain, and I don't have any Mordheim terrain right now, because all the terrain I made um, for Mordheim obviously belonged to Mini Wargaming and is still there. I don't know if it's getting used or not, but I don't have it, so um, I have to make some new terrain. Um, I still have all my warbands and stuff though, so once that gets done, and there's actually some local guys I know that are super interested in doing it too, um, hopefully I'll make some more videos. Now if I was going to try and get people interested in Mordheim, the biggest selling point I think it has is it's just a really good campaign skirmish system for Warhammer Fantasy. So if they're already Warhammer Fantasy players, then you can play Mordheim pretty much with your army as you go. Most of the Mordheim, are, uh, sorry, the Fantasy armies have lists um, in Mordheim where you could just take your models, find appropriate sort of rules for them and start playing. Now the, uh, the weirder armies sometimes don't, but most of the armies do. Um, and so if you're trying to recruit friends, that's kind of a big selling point. Now uh, the other selling point is, for the most part, you can make a Mordheim Warband out of a single box from Warhammer Fantasy. Uh, if you just wanted to do human mercenaries, the Empire Militia box is still the old Mordheim box. So all you would need to do is buy one of those and you have literally the starter set from the original Mordheim box set. Uh, same goes with Skaven, with the Skaven Gutter Runners. You get the, sorry, the Night Runners Gutter Runners box set. If you just bought that box set, you are ready to play. Um, all you need to do is crack them open, build some more bands, and go. Uh, most of the other warbands you could do a very similar thing with. Uh, you'd have a hard time not being able to build a high elf warband or the Shadow Warriors box. Um, and for the other armies, you could probably build a uh, possessed warband out of. Well, I'm trying to think of what you'd use for that. A Marauder box might get you started. Um, uh, Dark Eldar actually would be a, not a bad box set for doing that either. Dark Eldar box for those and just use human bits and pieces. Uh, and yeah, and that would be the biggest selling point I would see is that you can just kind of like grab any fantasy box you want and get going. Um, and then of course, the other big selling point is the rules are all free. Um, if you just go to any of the many, many hosting sites that still host all of the, uh, the rules from Mordheim, you can go to the Yak Tribe Gaming uh, forum, which is a forum dedicated to the old skirmish games from Warhammer uh, and Warhammer 40k, so Necromunda and Mordheim. In their archive, I'm pretty sure they have all the uh, the rules for all of those games still posted somewhere. So it shouldn't be hard for you to find them. They're all public domain, I think, because they're released as free PDFs, so they're sitting somewhere um, on somebody's server, basically preserved, uh, and you can just take them to Kinko's and get them printed, or stick them on your iPad, which is what I do, um, and have, you know, for years, and uh, play with them until you're tired of playing with them and that way my nice copies of the physical hard rule books get preserved in my little personal stash of old books what's next 
Crownblade asks, have you heard of Frostgrave? It's a new skirmish game. It sounds kind of Mordheimish. Might be worth taking a look. I have actually. I've taken a look at it. It's got um, some kind of neat wizard models. I like the evil Santa Claus model the best. There's like this one wizard that basically looks like a Viking Santa Claus. Um, and the whole premise of the game, for those of you that don't know what Frostgrave is, is it's like wizards and their apprentices adventuring in some ruined city for like magical artifacts um the miniatures are okay like they're nice enough they're they have a kind of a 90s like cartoony vibe to them and they look pretty cool and i'll probably check it out um mostly because i feel like i could just use all my saga miniatures i already have and probably just play the game right away so i'll, I'll buy i'll buy a rule book for anything just to check out the rules usually um but yeah when i see it gets like a full release and stuff i think it's osprey's actually doing it because they've been interested in miniature lines the last little while um in miniature games the last little while then hopefully uh i'll be able to check it out who's next Raphael Pizek asks, what do you think of Flames of War? Would you be getting into that? I actually have two Flames of War armies. Um, I have a, a US para army that's like 75% painted and I have a large um, German mid-war uh, Grenadier army that's all the way done. Um, and I haven't played the game in years. I think I played about two games of that game in first edition and then I bought all the rule books and I got a little bit upset because it seemed like every year I was having to buy the game over again. <laughs> like, <laughs> I have probably three editions of rule books for that game and I've played two games, or maybe three games total. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I certainly like the models. Um, the rule set is really simple. Like, it basically is just 40K. Like, you move, shoot, fight has the same phase sequence for the turn. Uh, it has a very similar um, vehicle dynamic for damaging vehicles, but instead of resisting, instead of, instead of penetrating armor with your vehicle's strength, you're resisting uh, uh, weapon damage with your vehicle's armor. So you roll dice and add your armor and try and beat strength of the attack as opposed to the other way around. Um, and then, yeah, infantry is just basically flattened into models that all have this like three plus generic save. Um, and then they're all graded based on how like trained they are. So I, I like the game. I think it was a neat mechanic. It certainly did a lot to make second edition uh, miniature wargaming accessible. And I think that's its huge success was it took it from um, sort of a game that was played mostly with the intent of trying to as closely as possible reproduce the historical results to a game where you could actually casually pick up and play. And a lot of its critics in the early years, that was the problem they had with it. They were like, this has nothing to do with history. You would never be fighting this army with this army. And the people that were sort of from pop culture wargaming that were gravitating towards it were just like, I don't care. Like, I, <laughs> I, want, my, I want my, you know, Tunisian British, like, cruiser tank army to fight your Stalingrad Soviets. And I don't care if it's nothing to do with the, you know, actual, like, history of the game. Um, I just want to see what would happen and play a cool game. And it, it has a good pick up and play rule set. Uh, good enough, at least, that I think it attracts a lot of pop culture war gamers. So, I hope to get, play it again in the future. I have lots of friends who actually play it, um, and it's played pretty heavily. I would imagine at uh, Lords of War, which is my good friend's store in Oakville. Um, so, I'm sure I will play it again at some point. I just haven't played it lately. Steve Lyon asks, "Hey Ash, happy to see you producing again. Favorite GW army and why? 40k or fantasy?" Dude, oh, I don't know. I get asked this question a lot. Um, and I don't, the problem is that like, I don't, I don't even know what my last answer to that question was. I like a lot of armies um, and I like them for different reasons. And what usually happens when I answer this question is the one that I've been working on the most recently or I've been thinking about a lot most recently um, is like in the top of my mind, it ends up being the air quotes favorite. So, I don't know. I think maybe right now, I just finished reading um, Fall of Altdorf, and it did a really good job of uh, kind of outlining the motivations of like the Chaos Army and how like, you know, just basically deranged they were and what they thought was going to happen when the world ended. Um, and so I was really enjoying that. I'm also reading Archeon Lord of the End Times which is kind of about his rise as he tries to find all the ever-chosen artifacts. Like he just tamed Gorthor, his like steed. Uh, and I kind of enjoyed that too. So Chaos has been on my mind a little while lately. Um, I mean, Chaos is fairly derivative. It's all basically Michael Moorcock's Elric uh, saga. Um, Chaos gods basically pulled in and, and made sort of GW's own. So I enjoy Chaos. Um, for 40k, and I guess that, that covers both bases. That means 40k and fantasy is covered because, uh, you know, they exist at a time in both universes. Um, 
But yeah, no, I don't really know. I'm sorry, dude. That's kind of a non-answer, but like, I really don't. Oh, it's ass. Great to see you on your feet again, brother. Shout out to the BNC, will ya? Ha, Bolter and Chainsword. Um, I was years and years and years ago, actually, a moderator when the Bolter and Chainsword first came about, um, and I was playing Blood or not Blood Ravens, Raven Guard. Uh, and I know a lot of the guys that were sort of the early days, um, I guess, founding figures in that forum. And we used to chat on I ICQ and stuff like that, you know, back when I was like, in university. Um, because it was a very early forum. Like, there wasn't... You didn't really have a lot of choice for your, your wargaming forums back then. The Bolter and Chainsword was a very early one. Um, and the guy that, uh, that founded it was a very talented artist uh, named Michael Lamb, who is still a very talented artist, actually. And, uh, yeah, I know. That's a, it's a very... It's a unique place that uh, has grown and is actually fairly... Fairly old. I mean, if you look at the forums of the internet, uh, I guess the big three would be Daka Daka, Warseer, and the Boltron Chainsword. And they've all been around for a very long time, although Warseer was called something else. It was called Portent back in the day. Um, Daka Daka has always been Daka Daka, but it's now changed hands several times, and it belongs to a completely different crew than it founded originally, as did the Boltron Chainsword. DC Denny asks, in light of the Capital Wasteland minis you showed on Facebook the other day, what video game do you think would translate into a good miniature game or uh, line or game, Fallout excluded, since it already exists? Okay, I would love, and I mean love, to see a, um, a Bioshock like miniature game. There's lots of like kind of not Bioshock miniatures out there, but I actually would say that this is actually what I thought I had for doing um, for Malfo, because Malfo exists around the same time as like Bioshock Infinite exists. I would love to see that like objectivist like super society like in a miniature game. So I think that um, just like Mordheim was a good like post-apocalyptic sort of like skirmish level game. You could get away with that same kind of game for a game like um, Bioshock. Like you could have like you know packs of splicers and packs of survivors and you know like uh, your your sort of like random hired swords where you've got like a big daddy and little sister like wandering on the table, or even they could just be like events. You know, like a thing that randomly happens, like a big daddy wanders into the middle of the fight and one side or the other like activates him and then just all hell breaks loose. I think that would be cool. Um, Fallout obviously I'm a big fan of and that's one that I would like to see happen as well. Um, the problem is that like right now, you've got a, a ton of properties out there for um, video games that don't necessarily translate really well um, into to, to miniature games because their IPs are fairly generic. Like, you couldn't do a Call of Duty miniature game because you'd just be making like whatever current historical modern, <laughs> you know, like rule set. Like, hey, look, it's soldiers and they're from now. Like, or World War II. Like, you couldn't do it because it's it, it's just history. Like, it has already exists. So you'd have to take a property that was fairly unique. I think and try and transpose it into, um, you know, a miniature game, and that's not necessarily something that video games are good at. I think Bioshock would be cool. That would be one that I would definitely like pick up if that was a thing. Um, or if they just did like a bunch of Malifaux minis that were basically like Rapture Objectivist or something like that, I would just totally buy those and play Malifaux with them instead. Anonymous asks, will you be seeing any historical games from you? Flames of War, Saga, Bolt Action, etc. Um, I have miniatures for all three of those games. The hardest part for me guys to bring a game here is that either I have to have two armies for it and I have to teach somebody how to play or someone has to come in and play me. So I can talk about those games all day. Like, I can talk about Flames of War. But if someone comes in and plays Flames of War with me, you guys get battle reports. Um, so it's a lot of work for me to usually bring an indie game to you guys, um, or a historical game, if people aren't playing. Now, luckily, around here, there are a bunch of people like currently getting into Bolt Action. So Bolt Action is fairly likely. Uh, and the guys at Lords of War Games and Hobbies are big Flames of War fans. So it's entirely possible that I'll get some Flames of War going. And what I'd like to do is when we bring a game like that onto the channel, I'd like to do a four-game series. Uh, and... Well, by that I mean basically a month's content. So each day on, you know, that day of the week for a month, which would be Tuesday for Out of the Basement, which is going to be like the indie game one or the smaller, lesser played game one, um, you would get a game of that for a month and then that series could just kind of stand alone for a while. Um, but yeah, that's the big channel. The challenge right now is I either have to plan to do it um, or someone needs to challenge me and come in and play. And hopefully that's going to happen. Uh, or I need two armies, right? Because like I, I have an army of all three of the games you just said. Um, I also have like a Secrets of the Third Reich Army, which is a cool World War II um, super science slash occult game, uh, which I think is getting a new edition actually relatively soon. But yeah, without 
without like an opponent, I can't very well make battle reports. Um, and so that's something I either have to source myself or teach someone how to play or whatever. So like luckily for certain games, like for Mercs, I have every team. So I can just teach someone how to play and you guys will get, you know, Mercs videos or something like that. And it's relatively like low impact. But for something like, you know, Saga, which arguably is a historical skirmish game, it still uses quite a few figures per side. It still uses like 40 to 50 figures per side sometimes um, if you're using a lot of like levy. And that means that it's a bit harder for me to bring you games like fast. Do, do, do. Stop touching my noodles. He says, I still love you. What kind of music do you like? Top five bands and artists. Thanks. I love you. Well, stop touching my noodles. I love you too. Um, let's think. Top five bands. So, so this is a, uh, I sometimes call this a championship final challenge, but it's actually, if you've read the book High Fidelity, that's what championship final is from. Um, a, high, a high fidelity top five list. Uh, we used to sit around in games or shop stores making top five lists all the time because it's a good way to pass the time um, and it makes you feel like life is imitating art. So top five bands and artists. Hmm. Well, you know what's an easy way to answer that? I could go to my recently played on my iTunes and see what's in there. But all time, or let's not do all time, let's just do right now. Um, I would say right now, probably in my top five, I've been listening to a lot of Led Zeppelin recently, mostly because I like my daughter to listen to Led Zeppelin, um, and I think that she likes to boogie to like up-tempo up and upbeat music, and a lot of the um, Zeppelin stuff she's been listening to is like super upbeat and up-tempo, so they'd be number five. Uh, I would say the specials are in there. Again, because I've been trying to get my daughter to listen to like a lot of upbeat like music that's mine, and the specials have this like awesome kind of like uh, Caribbean inspired ska thing that they do that is really like it has sort of like that plinky plunk um, uh, tunage to it that she really responds to. So I enjoy the specials. Uh, what else have I been listening to recently? I'm listening to Glitch Mob a lot, uh, and they're kind of a, a instrumental electronic. I don't want to say they're like, they're not really dubstep. They're kind of more like a modern DJ Shadow, like found sound, like jam electronic band. And I've been really enjoying them. I saw them live uh, in Memphis a little while ago, a little while ago, like a year ago now, maybe two years ago now, year and a half ago. And I enjoy them, so yeah, Glitch Mob. Uh, if you've never heard of them, I guarantee at some point you've probably heard them in a commercial, because I've noticed that a ton of their stuff has been getting pulled into, especially like car commercials le recently. You've probably heard a Glitch Mob song at one point, and just you know just assumed it was weird Tron-sounding music in a car commercial, and not actually like you know registered that it was a band. So that's three: the Specials, Glitch Mob, Zeppelin. Oh, uh, I haven't been listening to Clutch very much recently, even though they are probably my favorite band because I missed their show on the 20th in Buffalo because we've been so like, basically like busy with the co-op and broke at home that I just didn't go to the show even though it was around the corner. So hopefully they come back because this was the the tour where they were demoing their new album, Psychic Warfare, which comes out in September. Um, but I'll put them on the list because I do love Clutch. And number one, favorite band at the moment, band I've been listening to a whole bunch. Actually, I've been listening to a lot of Saul Williams again recently, and if you don't know him, he was in a, a movie in the 90s called Slam, about like slam poetry, and he does like some slam poetry, hip hop, like just sort of fusion stuff. His more recent album is a little more poppy, and I wasn't super into it. I think it was Volcaic Sunlight or something like that it was called, but yeah, that's those are the bands I've been listening to lately, and I've been enjoying. Bingo Boo Boo! Have you looked into Mantic's modular scenery? I have, um, actually. I've seen tons of it. There's a couple problems I have with it. One, if you don't have connectors, like you get this sprue of like connectors that all the big pieces need to have to go together. And they only give you so many connectors. So the, the big problem is that like when you run out of those, you can't make any more scenery. And like that just seems like a design flaw to me. <laughs> like I don't want to. I don't want to be limited to the amount of scenery I can make because you didn't give me enough connecto pieces to put it all together, and you want me to go buy another kit. Um, the other problem I kind of have with it right now is the plastic it's made out of. It just feels a bit wimpy. Um, it's not very heavy gauge, and I don't know if it's glueable with polystyrene. Something I haven't actually tried yet because I've just been handling like the frames and stuff. But I wasn't a massive huge fan of it. Um, I think it's great for like kit bashing and using all of its detail pieces to sort of accessorize 
kits that you're kind of making yourself. So like if you're making like the main body of something and you want to use that stuff to detail, I think it's awesome. I don't know if a, a whole table of it might get a little, it's a bit Lego scenery E like it's a bit like the GW um, building ruins where it kind of gets kind of samey after a while. And uh, you end up having buildings that look just look very similar because you're just using the same panels over and over again. So it's not I don't like it, but uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to run out and buy it because, you know, I just, it, it doesn't feel like terrain that I would want to have stand alone. Like I'd have to make like a bunch of like MDF to have it all sit on and, you know, reinforce it all. And I could just be working with actual MDF scenery right now, which I'm actually super partial to because with wood glue, man, MDF scenery will just last forever uh, and seems to be basically indestructible. So I've been doing a lot of stuff with that. And it tends to be a bit cheaper too. And Taros asks, say Ash, have you ever encountered a person who's been in the hobby for a decent amount of time and is just bad at painting and never improved? Yeah, for sure, absolutely. Um, and it's usually because they don't enjoy it very much. Like, I think that's fine. Like there's people that do um, all different aspects of this hobby they don't particularly enjoy. Uh, for instance, I don't particularly like building miniatures. I have friends, man, like they, their, their whole thing is building miniatures. They will sit and assemble miniatures for hours and never paint them. And they have scads of miniatures that they've built that are beautifully converted, like cleaned, ready to go. And they never put paint on them. And I would rather do anything other than building miniatures. Like I, I put this camera on and talk to you guys so that I can pretend I'm not building miniatures in the last episode of the show. Uh, so yeah, um, but yeah, no, I think that that's, I think that it's a personal thing. Like, but of course being an immersion painter or an immersion player, I really only enjoy playing against painted miniatures because the, the whole point of playing the game to me is that this little like movie is rolling while we're doing it. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't think it's I don't think there's anything right or wrong with it. I think that people that don't enjoy painting, they tend to just get it. It becomes very functional to them. They do it. They get it done. Um, it you know it serves a purpose. Like they do it to they do it to completion, but they don't do it like it's like an art form. Like they're not trying to they're not trying to push and improve. It's more of a workman sort of uh, process for them. I think that's completely fine. And I have no problem playing against painted models that are just assembled and base coated. Like that's fine to me. Um, and I think that I think that that's just even doing that for someone that doesn't enjoy it. I have more respect for those people because they've pushed themselves to try and do something. I think because they even if they don't don't enjoy doing it, they realize it's important and that it adds to the enjoyment maybe of the people that they're playing against. Um, so I have a huge amount of respect for people that don't enjoy or not, not necessarily good at painting but push themselves to do it anyway, because it tends to be that they're doing it out of respect for like the game or their opponent or whatever, like their sense, their own sense of pride even. Like, I don't like doing this, but I'm gonna do it because like this is, this is how you, this is how you complete, like, you know, unlock that achievement. Like, hey, now I'm playing the way that, you know, it's intended to be played, like on a nicely upon a table with painted models and painted scenery. I've, I, have, I have achieved that. I've pushed myself to do something and create something, even though it wasn't something I necessarily enjoyed. <clears throat> Rune Godi asks, hello. So I'm putting a dwarf for me together. The colors are maroon and green with gold trim. The base is gray and stone. What colors should I do the grudge ponies? <laughs> How many grudge ponies do you have? Isn't there just like the one grudge pony that came with um, assault on black, pa or uh, assault on, uh, no, no. Battle skill pass. That's one. It's battle skill pass. Uh, I don't know. Brown. You've got maroon in there. You've got gold in there. Doesn't sound like there's any. Cool, this is, okay, there's already gray and stone. Maroon, green with gold trim. Base is green and stone. Push the grudge ponies. Uh, I would do it a dun color then. Something like that. I think that's a dun color. That's a good like neutral tone then to have, but it's fairly warm. Um, so it would go with the rest of the warm palette I think you're using. Um, yeah. Weird question. <laughs> <laughs> Pitch shift asks, hey, from Australia, how did you get into wargaming? Sorry if you've answered this before. Um, I think I have, but I'll do it again. Uh, I discovered wargaming um, sort of two ways that ended up coming together. Uh, the first way was I discovered um, Citadel Miniatures through the back of a Choose Your Own Adventure series called Fighting Fantasy, which if you know a little bit about the history of um, Citadel Miniatures, was actually the book series that the two founders of Games Workshop, the, the, the chain, um, produced back in the late 70s and early 80s. And they had a uh, like beginner's RPG book called Fighting Fantasy. 
that in in the back of it basically said, hey, what a, what's a great way to you know enhance your enjoyment of playing you know role playing games is through using miniatures. Check out Citadel Miniatures. There's a little blurb for Citadel Miniatures. I didn't really put two and two together until I went to um, my best friend at the time's uh, house, just like hand and play when I was like eight years old. We were in uh, Cub Scouts together. And his older brother had tons and tons of Citadel miniatures on display in his room, and I got to look at them. And I didn't really know what they were until later, but like going to then like the local like book slash uh, like uh, trading card store, and this is long, long before Magic, like they sold like hockey cards and stuff. Um, and seeing Citadel miniatures, that's kind of how I figured it out. And I ended up buying my first couple of miniatures. And I think my first one was actually a Rackham Undead Troll. And then just like some testers and enamels and like figuring out how to paint them and you know, and on and on and on from there. As we do, we figure out like, hey, this is a thing and then we try and teach ourselves how to do it. That's how I, that's how I discovered Wargaming. Yarden, about Adeptus Mechanicus, if the Skitari are in the Admech book or even since both codexes are fairly small, what is, do you think is the reason for GW double dipping? Um, I don't think they're double dipping. I think what's happened is they've just done it backwards from what they normally do. Usually they do a main book and then they would do some kind of like add-on book afterwards. I think what they've done uniquely this time is, and actually I think it's kind of genius, is they've given you a way to play with a small amount of models right away by doing the small book first. This would be like if you, when they did Astro Militarum, if they did the Tempestus Scions as a first release and then Astro Militarum afterwards. In this case, it, like historically, that's what they did before those. They did Astro Militarum, the big book, as the first wave, and they did the Tempest of Science book as a second wave. They've just reversed it this time. They did the Skitari first, and then they did the Adeptus Mechanicus, Cult Mechanicus book second. Um, and it seems smart to me because it, that way you can release some really cool new miniatures you haven't released before that are actually the bulk of both books. Uh, but then you can um, give people a way to like play and enjoy with them early and just kind of spread out you know, this line. Because what you're doing there is you're talking about GW creating an entirely new line and army in 40K. And you like his, like the traditional way that they've done that is they've done this huge release all at once. But even then it hasn't been that big. Like I remember when the Tau came out, I was working at GW um, as a part-timer. It was like my first position. And man, we couldn't keep that stuff in stock. But there wasn't that many codes like to the entire release. It was just six or eight boxes and then some variations on those boxes, and it wasn't actually a huge amount of stuff. This way, by spreading it over more time, I think they could probably produce a bit more, um, not sell out necessarily as much, and keep it in production, keep it on the shelves, and give people a way to play with it and enjoy it in the meantime by doing this Guitari book sort of in advance of the uh, Mechanics book. So I think it's smart marketing. Kaiser Jez says, are you wearing guy liner? No, man, this is just all natural, this right here. And my daughter has it too, and I am terrified for her ability to manipulate men in the future. Um, I, uh, I have had these eyelashes my entire life, and yeah, that's my burden to bear. Um, but yeah, I know these pretty eyes are mine. Peter Wass asks, have you looked at Carnival at all? It seems really pretty. Yeah, the miniatures are super pretty. Um, I actually, it's one of very few miniature games that I haven't actually read the rulebook for yet. Uh, but probably should. I think they did a Kickstarter. I was kind of looking at the Wrath of Kings Kickstarter at the same time because it's kind of a spiritual successor to Raka or to Confrontation, which is one of my all-time favorite games. And so I didn't get a huge close look at either. I kind of hemmed and hawed about them, and I think my attention went elsewhere, and I didn't do anything about both. So uh, I should probably go and revisit it because, as you say, the models are super duper pretty and. Um, yeah, it seems like it'd be up my alley. But it kind of fell into the same niche for me as Malifaux and a lot of these other Victorian Gothic horror. Although it's, I think it's, um, it's not doing Victorian, it's doing, what is it? Uh, uh, with the, the, the Venetian mask. It's doing like a Venetian like, sort of like uh, uh, thing, same sort of ear, same sort of premise, but using like a different historical sort of like draw. I mean, yeah, I know, I should go take a, check it out. Tumblebuck, hey Ash, if you describe your perfect codex, what would it be and why? Hmm. I don't know. Um, I've had a few codexes that probably stand out to me for 40K in the past that I remember really fondly because they tried something new. Um, one would be the second edition Angels of Death Codex for 40K, and that was because it put two codex, two, two sets of rules into a single book. Uh, you got the Dark Angel and the Blood Angel rules in one book. 
and they did a great job of like diving into the history of both um really trying to get you to feel the the differences between two armies lots of different models and we're talking about like the 90s here right so like this was a this was a vastly different thing than they'd been doing with codexes at the time um and then another one that i remember really really fondly is actually the fourth no third or fourth edition i think it's it's fourth edition yeah the fourth edition space marine codex and one of the reasons i remember it so fondly was we used it for a battle report i did in white dwarf 300 um and it was the first time that they basically piled in all these rules for making like your own space marine chapter so they gave you like rules for um chapter traits and like basically design like hey what was your founding from what what is what is it that makes your army unique i thought that was genius like you gave people stuff to play with and of course, it wasn't. It didn't exist in later codexes because I think it got abused a little bit. But it was such a great like. Anytime you get to play with more options and like fiddle around with like the core mechanics of your army list in 40k, and and they kind of gave you more permissions. I think that was really really cool. The the downside, of course, is that it. I think that there's an accepted idea that. GW and 40k gamers in general need permission to do things now. They're so used to being told this is what's legal and this isn't what's legal that like you have to actually write a book that says like now you can do this as opposed to just letting people, you know, have fun and write lists that, you know, are their own and play games with their friends. They have to be given like a format for doing it in because everything has to happen in a format now in a, in a accepted and agreed upon way because there's like a supposition that you're you're never playing your friends you're always playing strangers uh so yeah those would be two that really pop in my head as being sort of like traditional and core favorites of mine um and for those reasons they just gave you more options and more stuff to play with uh, uh, next and omaka asks what are you using the elder codex do they take it an already over the top level army and buffed to the point of stupidly OP. Um, well, here's the thing. <laughs> no matter what's written in a codex or an army list, nothing that's written in there removes an element of choice. So if, if someone decides that they want to take an army strictly based upon its power curve and they have the dollars to go out and do that, so uh, proxying aside, you're assuming that everyone's playing with WYSIWYG miniatures and someone goes and buys a hundred uh, scatter laser jet bikes for Warhammer 40k and they make their army around that and then they, they build their Wraith Lord with D templates and blah blah blah. Then you're playing a guy whose only interest is winning, right? So just accept that, that that's how that guy wants to play and play him way we want and then don't play him again. But nine times out of a hundred, like, there's this idea, I think, on the internet that everyone's always playing a tournament game all the time. You're not, and, and if you're playing that competitively, if you're not playing with models because you like them, but you like what they do in the game, then that may very well be a problem for you. That may very well be a reason for you to stop playing, you know, your Eldar army um, or against an Eldar army, but not every game's happening in a tournament, so I don't think it ruins 40K, and I don't think that it, even ruins Eldar because people people who play Eldar will you decide they're going to play the army that way or they won't and that's it and people who go to tournaments they'll adapt like they always do they'll figure out some way to beat it um, I don't know that it can beat an all night army anymore then it can beat you know an all drop pod space brain army that might end up on top of it in the first turn or whatever conditional things happen in scenarios or whatever that make it so the game it, the game is never just unwinnable you don't take into account terrain, you don't take into account um, objectives and all that stuff too. So it's really easy to math out on the internet in a you know perfect flat table environment how that, that army is completely broken. But you have to assume first the person playing it has chosen to play it that way. Um, and second, that, that that's the only reason that anyone would play a codex ever. Not that they like pretty models and they like playing a cool army. So I don't think it's, I, I think that they just gave people more options and one of those options may be incredibly powerful but it's still up to the, the player to take that option or not take that option ant asks when you start getting into a new system do you plan a list then buy or simply go bananas and buy whatever takes your fancy probably more the former than the latter i try and do it a little bit at the beginning but my usual way of like looking at buying miniatures is to go oh well that that's a cool miniature i'm gonna try and i'm gonna figure out what that guy does and then base an army around whatever that guy does so like for instance, um, if I really like model A 
and Model A's special rules that Model B, C, and D, even if people tell me those models aren't very good, is usually in their army, or maybe that their story means that those are usually in the army, then I will probably go and buy all those models regardless of what the plan is in the game, and I'll figure that stuff out later. Um, I, I, I usually purchase miniatures and armies with my gut, and sometimes it works out, and sometimes it doesn't. So like, for instance, I really like Lucius and Malifaux uh, as a guild miniature. He has one of the lower power scaled like crew boxes I discovered. Doesn't make him bad, it just means that he took a little longer to figure out how to play him. Um, whereas when I got the Jacob Lynch crew box, his rules and stuff were pretty straightforward and I was murdering things with a giant smoke monster pretty much from the very beginning. And then when it would get killed, bringing it back to life. And yeah, I felt a little bad about that, but you know, I bought it because I thought he was cool. He's a card player. Joe asks, hey Ash, what's your favorite army from any war game and why? Do you have any stories for that army? I don't have a favorite army. I, my favorite thing is always the thing I'm currently working on. I tend to invest a lot of like interest into my current projects and then not come back to them. So like for instance, when I was redoing a lot of ogre stuff, I was super excited about my ogres. And then I just kind of like, I played a lot of games with them. I got to a comfortable point where I was comfortable with my army list and I got disinterested in buying and painting, or sorry, building and painting the new stuff. Um, doesn't mean I don't love my ogre army. It just means that like something shiny catches my attention and I go off and start doing that. But my favorite army from any war game and why, I really liked um, my uh, my Keltwa army from, um, what is it called? Uh, Confrontation 3.5. Um, and mostly just because of their like look. They had this like Conan the Barbarian uh, so, like, kind of crazy look. And they were the underdogs of the game. Like individually, all of their guys weren't very good and they had to like gang up and you had to use some really specific tactics to be good with them. Um, and I made them pretty dirty towards the end of playing Confrontation 3.5. People liked playing my Lions of Alhan army still. But my buddies Chris and Nico didn't like playing my Celt army very much because it used to just gang up on people and throw a million dice. Um, but yeah, no, that would be, it's usually reasons like that that I remember stuff fondly more than anything else. Doo -doo -doo. Oops. Go back. Go back. No, 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 no. Go back, I say. This is the problem with iPads. Sometimes it hits something wrong. Jordan Green asks, hey Ash, I'm a big fan of yours and you basically got me an infinity through your various bat reps. My question is, have you ever had a chance to make your own mini game? What genre would it be? Well, I've talked about that in past pieces of Ash and um, I actually made my own mini game ages ago, like in 2009. I wrote a zombie apocalypse game um, that was based around every bad zombie movie I'd ever seen. And someday I will finish it and get all the photography for it done and you guys will probably get to play it. But probably not right now because I'm a bit busy making this channel. Zach asks, would you ever consider the game bolt action? I already answered that, yes. Someone come play me. Brent asks, do you think there should be more assault vehicles available to Space Marines? No. Um, Space Marines are all about flexibility and punching things in the face. If you're carrying a rifle, is probably not the best way of getting things done. And also Space Marines tend to be very practical, which means that if you can hit someone without them ever hitting you back, they would probably opt for that. Also, you have a flying assault vehicle and a uh, rolling on the ground assault vehicle. They both happen to be a lot of points, but that doesn't make them bad. Sherbivore asks, just got back into gaming. Army is old and underpowered. Lose nine out of 10 games. Starting to not want to attend game nights. Opponents keep playing their most powerful lists. How do I avoid becoming salty and toxic? Get new opponents. <laughs> Sorry. Like that's the best way to do it. Um, if people just keep playing their most powerful list over and over again, then obviously their main thing isn't that you have fun, it's that they have fun and the, clearly the thing that they're having fun doing is beating you. Uh, I don't even find that entertaining. Like just pulling a guy apart because he doesn't really know what your stuff does and you have something that he's not aware of and you know you, you, you can be dominant has zero appeal for me. Like I would rather, I'd rather be challenged in a game and feel like both sides are you know, basically undergoing the mental exercise of seeing who can win than to just like completely dominate somebody. Like I hate tabling people and not taking a lot of casualties. I would rather, you know, like I, I would rather win the game and both of us have taken massive casualties and for it to have some kind of interesting like conclusion because then I feel like the game, the game had like a back and forth. And that means that, you know, I want my opponent to be challenging. I want to be able to, to talk to my opponent about my strategies while it's happening. It just feels like a better, I don't know, it's a better outcome for me. So I know it's glib to say get better opponents, but 
if that's not what your opponents are doing for you, then you might need to try and find new people to play against. Like, it, it's easy to be salty when you haven't adapted necessarily to what the current meta is like. But it's very hard to not be able to take any miniatures in most war games and at least compete a little bit. Like, even in 40k, man, if you're playing 40k and you feel like you're being outclassed by everything, then stop trying to play kill your opponent and start playing for the objectives. Try playing maelstrom missions. Try playing missions where you know, where you are and what you're doing count for more than who you've killed this turn. Uh, and you might enjoy it more. Or just try playing the game differently. Like, don't play maybe full 40k games, try playing some kill team games. Because, you know, definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. And if right now the result you're getting is you're not enjoying yourself, then you should probably try something different. Do no name. Hey Ash, I'm thinking about getting an airbrush. Can you explain what I would need and any recommendations? Well, you'd need an airbrush and a compressor, and then you'd probably need just some basic things. Like uh, I usually use rubber gloves just while I'm airbrushing. Um, I use an old margarine container to clean my brush into, just something to catch all the spray while I'm um, spraying just like super high pressure water out of it to, to clean out the paint chamber and stuff. And um, yeah, just the airbrush and the compressor after that. You can go to, if you live anywhere in North America that has access to a Michael's Arts and Crafts, you can usually get a coupon to go and get your airbrush at 30 to 40% off. That would be my recommendation is try and, try and find some place that does couponing. Hobby Lobby very often does that too in the States. Uh, you can get your, your airbrush significantly cheaper than you would pay in wholesale for it. Michael's and Hobby Lobby, I believe, both sell the Patriot 105, which is a good starter airbrush for pretty much anybody. Um, you can buy new needles for it if you want to make it a bit finer, but just for throwing down base coats and some fades and stuff, um, that airbrush will do pretty much everything you need. Uh, and it's actually the airbrush that's sitting right here. Uh, I have a couple other airbrushes that I use for various other things, but that's my workhorse, like for paint and terrain, getting base coats down, stuff like that. Uh, the um, the 105 is pretty much a, a workhorse airbrush that will be easy to clean, fairly easy to maintain, and do pretty much everything you need to do. Um, and then for my compressor, I have a little Awada Sprint Jet. Um, uh, it's a cheapo airbrush, or again, that you can probably get it in some place like an arts and crafts store. Uh, and if you're frugal and you can grab some coupons, you can usually get it for pretty cheap. Dex86 asks, hey Ash, love the look of your new co-op. When will we be seeing you paint your Ogre Baker for the minis and backers perks? Will you be doing some of those uh, whilst you sit and talk? That's part of the plan, yes. I would love to do some of the backer minis while I'm doing this. Uh, I'm trying to get through this Malifaux stuff right now for a contract that I have with a gaming store or a web store to do content, and then I need to really start cranking those out. So I think you'll probably see me working on that stuff a lot while I'm doing this, because Obviously, the number that I ended up having to do is way higher than I expected. Um, and any time at the co-op, I need to start chipping away at the amount of models I have to paint and then taking stuff back home too to paint while I'm sitting with my kids, which usually will mean taking like my paint tray, just the paints I need to go do that, getting all the airbrushing and stuff done while I'm here and then taking it home to paint. So definitely you'll see some of that stuff. Um, and if you ever wanna see what I'm working on, usually I post pics on my Facebook page. So like for instance, this won't come out until the first, but this, or not the first, but until next week. But the um, the photos I'll take today probably be on my Facebook page, and you can usually see what I've been working on painting. Andy C asks, hey Ash, can you get Chris as a guest in your future piece of Ash? That'd be epic, especially if you keep the same sit chat hobby format. Um, I'd like to. Chris is usually doing way the brush on Saturdays, and I'm usually working on Saturdays, so I think our schedules might be not greatly lined up, but uh, we are gonna try and get some of the guys from Any Wargaming in here to play some games. Steve-O's gonna come play some Alpha with me. Uh, we got disconnected this weekend, but hopefully uh, we'll get to in the near future. Uh, and you can see us sit around and goof around and chat. Klaus Christensen asks, how do you feel about 2015 ITS for Infinity? Man, I did a great review of 2015 ITS uh, for Mini Gaming that I guess never saw the light of day because I left a whole bunch of content that didn't get aired. Um, and I wish I still had the notes for it because I don't know where they went. <laughs> but I wrote a ton of notes on the format and talked about how I thought it pushed uh, the game into specific directions. So for instance, the majority, I don't remember the exact number because I, I don't have it in front of me. I'm not gonna be able to like, quote my, my exact stuff that I said in that video. But at least, um, I think there's only three or four missions in the entire thing that are about domination. I think there's only two that are about killing or surviving, and that's uh, Annihilation and Biotech 4. 
And then the majority of them, I think 11 out of like the 18, require you to take some kind of specialist. So the specialist push in 2015 ITS has remained. Like getting somewhere with a specific model and doing something is still very much, for a lot of those scenarios, the thrust of what ITS is. And I think that's a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing in that um, killing your opponent isn't the only way to win the game. And I'm a big proponent of that. It's one of the reasons why I like Maelstrom missions so much in uh, 40k is that tabling your opponent isn't, I mean, it's a option, but it's not the easiest option. And it's certainly not necessarily the best option for winning in, in most Maelstrom scenarios, unless you keep pulling up, you know, destroy unit, destroy unit, destroy unit, which is pretty hard to do. Um, in ITS, you can very often be way ahead. I actually won a game of highly classified against Owen uh, not too long after the co-op opened where he'd done way more damage to me. Um, I think I only had like, I was, I was cl very close to being in retreat, except retreat wasn't being used in that scenario. I think it was, was it highly classified we played? I think it was highly classified. Maybe actually, maybe actually I was in retreat at the end, but I didn't lose um, because I was up on objective points like crazy and I'd pulled out and completed my objective. So it, it, it has a great narrative feel to me because guys can still die, you know what I mean? Like you can still lose your team, but as long as you've completed what you were sent there to do, you can still win the game overall. And I like that. Now, did I, do I wish there was a bit more balance in certain things? Yes, um, being able to achieve 10 on both sides, I think is a problem. So like there's a lot of missions where both sides can almost win through achieving objective points. And then, you know, the, the person that wins the tournament becomes a little bit unclear because the, the guy might have been tabled, but he got 10 objective points and you got 10 objective points. And then it, it, there was a tie breaking system, which is victory points. But like, I, I don't necessarily like a format where it doesn't feel at the end of the game like anybody won. And there's an ability to sandbag too. You and an opponent could just mutually agree mid round, hey, let's just both go and try and get 10 objective points. <laughs> And then we won't play again. And one of us will play a scrub and maybe win the tournament. And that's like a valid tactic. Like you can actually do that in ITS. Um, like early on if you're not playing for the final the final game. And that's kind of problematic to me because your, your objective points are like the overall win condition for the whole tournament. Um, and they're all that really matters. So there's I think there's a bit of tweaking that can be done in there. I do think that some of the objectives like are just purely too hard to play. Um, Beacon Race uh, is an almost impossible mission for ITS, and I think as a, as a TO, I would probably never use it, uh, simply because it it's a very movement-intensive uh, mission. It's a very hard mission to score a high number of objective points in, and it's a very high. Uh, it's very hard to get a good spread of objective points as well. So. If one of the point, things that you need in order to have a clearly defined winner overall in your tournament is to have a spread of points, any scenario that doesn't allow you to have a, a decent spread at the end of the game tends to be a, a problematic scenario and you might not want to include it in your super set of scenarios that you use. Um, but yeah, other than that, I think more ways to play Infinity other than just shooting your opponent is one of the things that makes Infinity a great game. Um, it, it makes Infinity a game that gets, you know, a little more diverse and it gets in people's heads and I'll, I'll, I think people struggle maybe when they first start playing a little bit because of that because they're used to the single win condition of hey if I kill more of your guys than, than you do or kill of mine then I've won the game and having to get places around the board and do stuff might be a bit alien to some wargamers um, but it's pretty heavily entrenched in ITS and I think that's really cool um, yeah, and I hope that they keep doing ITS every year. I do hope they reboot the Workhorse program right now, though, because I've been trying to apply for a while, and right now it's shut because they're not happy with it, and I guess they're going to be doing a new Workhorse um, program in the future, which I'm going to be applying to, and then you'll be able to see me actually rank tournaments. And what'll be really cool um, is if I get into the Workhorse program, is anybody who comes to play Infinity with me here in the co-op, we can count it as a, um, a one-game tournament, and we can rank all our games, which means that all, t all, all basically Infinity play in the co-op would be considered tournament play and would count for rankings, which I think is super cool. Um, so here's open, knock on wood, they get that stuff sorted out soon, and we can start doing ITS stuff here in the co-op. Next question, 48 minutes in. Hey Ash, have any neat collectibles from your time working with GW? What kind of stuff us mere mortals can dream of? Um, I got a few bits and bobs. Uh, I think that, you know, I've got some stuff that's very personal, like, um, you know, like my, uh, my awards and stuff like that that I think are really, they're important to me because I mean, it's 13 years of my life, right? Like, 
you spend your a long time doing something and stuff that makes you remember it is kind of cool and i have a few things that are just like gizmos like pins and bulldog stuff um bulldog productions was the company that made all the like pins and belt buckles and stuff in the early 2000s that was kind of neat i have some of that stuff lots of limited edition miniatures uh, one that escaped me though was the ogre bra slave lord. He was a staff gift uh, for um, the UK that you know was just available to them basically for Christmas, and it's like the only ogre miniature I don't own, <laughs> which bothers me uh, mostly from a collection point of view. Like ah, uh, it's the only ogre miniature I don't own, um, and he was an okay miniature. Like he wasn't a, the world's greatest sculptor or like that, but it's the fact that he's unique that makes me go, ah, I wish I had that miniature. Um, and then other stuff, like my 10-year vet's coat, like you get a leather jacket at 10-year. Uh, my Canadian 5-year vet's coat, which was like a bomber. It was like a varsity jacket. So I have this awesome like Degrassi Junior High varsity jacket with like the GW logo on it. It's got like leather sleeves and they've never made those anywhere else, I don't think. So that was a strictly Canadian thing. Anybody that has a, uh, a GW 5-year vet varsity jacket, you are... You are one of the few, the chosen people of Canada that were, um, you know, gifted with like the coolest bomber ever. Uh, what else? I'm trying to think of what else. Nothing else really pops to mind. I mean, most of my other stuff that's like a, a collectible from from the years of GW is is just actual GW products that I think are great. So like, I have a. Um, I got as a birthday present once actually from an old employee of mine, a good friend of mine named Ryan, um, a, an unopened copy of Adeptus Titanicus, which is GW's first boxed game. Um, and was like the epic Titan duel game. And basically, uh, like it blew my mind. Cause one, how do you find an unopened copy of that game in like 2007? <laughs> and then uh, we're at um, Games Day's dinner, doing a whole bunch of stuff for the managers there. Cause we're running a sales conference. And uh, we have, we bring in head of retail as an area manager at the time, head of retail um, brings in Jervis Johnson to sign all the 40K rule books. Cause 40K fifth edition had just come out. And he basically does like a little Q and A sit down and signs all the rule books for everybody that's there at the sales conference. And so all these managers are like lined up, like getting their rule book signed, chatting with Jervis. He's like super cool because he's such a nice guy um, and just like so patient and, and nice and generally like pleasant to people who are just geeking out all over him. Um, and then I'm standing like, at the back of the line with this unopened copy of the Death of Titanicus under my arm. And I'm like the last guy in line. And I just, I put it down and he's like, where did you get this? But he wrote it. It was one of the first miniature games he wrote. Um, and so I, I had him autograph it. And so that's one of my cool kind of collectibles is I have a, a Jervis Johnson autographed, unpunched uh, copy of Adept Titanicus sitting in my little archive of Citadel products, which is in my, st it's all in storage right now, but which I'd like to actually bring out and like display somewhere someday. I think that'd be something cool is to do a little museum. People, something people could come and see um, of like all the old Wargaming products that I have that I've kept that, you know, I'm, I'm preserving basically for future generations. Uh, what's next? Ty asks, what's your method for building a list for infinity? Do you focus on objectives, firepower, or a little bit of everything? Um, for infinity, I tend to go with battlefield roles because I don't tend to play for a specific set of objectives in mind, especially because classifieds are generic. Um, I try and take the gamut of what needs to get done. So I always know the primary objective, because especially if you're doing tournament play for infinity, you're gonna know the super set of like, um, the main objectives. So like for instance, if, if my objectives are annihilation, quadrant control, and I don't know, highly classified. I know for at least one of them I have to have specialists. Like highly classified, I need to have specialist. Annihilation, I'm gonna be killing guys and trying to keep as much stuff alive as humanly possible. Um, and then for um, quadrant control, it's kind of a blend. Like I need to do a bit of both, but mostly I need to have some, some models that have a decent individual point value or one big heavy model that I can shove into a zone to make sure that I own it. Um, and so what I tend to do is tend to buy models based on their battlefield role instead of buying it based on their sort of like individual stats. So like if I take a tag, um, I tend to always take some type of repair model and um, a remote, like a synchronized remote. So I'll take like something like a Palbot with a machinist in my Pan Oceania army. Um, I'll take a Yao Zhao with a mech engineer in my Yuching army. And why is that? Well, if you're gonna invest a bunch of points in a model, then you wanna also keep it alive. 
In my Ariadne army, on the other hand, um, I tend to pepper in baby specialists with the hitters. And all my hitters are fairly reasonably priced and some of them can be specialists as well. So like, if I have my tank hunter ADHL who's got infil sorry, not infiltration, but camouflage um, and hiding, uh, I'll park a veteran Kazakh paramedic next to him solely because that paramedic might bring him back to life if he dies. Uh, or goes down. And because there's no two wound infantry in Ariadna, I tend to I tend to take paramedics over doctors. Um, and I take tend to take more of them than I normally would. One, because they're a chief specialist, and two, because they can get my fairly expensive miniatures back on their feet uh, if they go down, which can be fair, you know, uh, an inconvenience if it happens at the wrong time. Um, and so uh, it, that tends to be my, my logic for stuff is it's, What's the multiple things that this model can do? So a paramedic can bring guys back online, he can achieve objectives and interact with them, and he's more useful to me, uh, probably because he's also a combat stick if he's a veteran Kazakh, than just a Kazakh doctor is hiding behind a wall with no you know, no remote presence remote that can run out and do his healing for him. Because a Kazakh doctor is just another line Kazakh to me, whereas a vet Kazakh paramedic, he can go and kick a door in at the same time. And complete an objective. So, those are my three like checkpoints for a model. Can they support each other? Um, can they do more than one battlefield role? Like, can they be beat sticks? Can they fulfill objectives? And can they keep other stuff going or online or, you know, complement the other models in the army somehow? And that's usually where I go. So I tend to buy models in little groups that'll hang out together in the battlefield. Like um, my ADHL tank hunter, my veteran Kazakh um, paramedic, and then a couple of line Kazakhs who are probably also paramedics, by the way, just in case one of the two big guys goes down, um, and to get more cheap specialists, because those are cheap specialists, they tend to all hang out together on the table, and then I move on and build like the next group. That's really easy to do with Toha, because you're just building tridents, you're trying to basically build like complementary models, and I've basically copy and pasted that idea into the other armies that I play in Infinity. Oh, one more. My four minutes left. Kurt Venetis, what is your take on how similar Wrath of Kings is in comparison to Confrontation? Well, it's intentional. <laughs> like, it's a spiritual successor, right? It's some of the same artists, some of the same sculptors. Um, and I, I happen to know a little bit about how and why Confrontation Phoenix hasn't happened. Um, and it's mostly to do with the, the, the dispersion of the molds after the whole thing went to pot and who they ended up with and what's currently happening with them and the fact they're being bootlegged. So um, Wrath of Kings is basically what those guys could do because they couldn't keep making confrontation. Now I wish confrontation was still happening. If confrontation Phoenix ever happens, I will be the happiest man alive because I have boxes and boxes of confrontation miniatures that I would love to like, I would love to repaint for one. Some of the old miniatures I'd probably redo. Um, and there's armies I have for confrontation that I never got around to painting that I would love to actually paint and play. And it was such a good game. It was such an elegant skirmish game. It was just the right amount of models. It had just a unique enough system that it really grabbed me. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's completely intentional. Um, I think that, uh, I, I wish them well. I, I wish that the game was probably doing a bit better than it is. Not that I think it's doing poorly, but it's certainly not you know a mainstream game by any stretch of the imagination. And I've, I'd heard that they had some production problems after the uh, the Kickstarter. You know, they basically slowed it down, getting into people's hands. Um, and yeah, and I hope that I hope that either it continues to do well and grows because it has Wolfen in it, which are like my favorite miniatures, probably. Um, still from confrontation and i i would totally if i was gonna play wrath of kings that would be the faction i would play uh and grows and that i eventually get into it and i probably will get into it because there's people around here that play it and i'll probably do an indie game spotlight on it um but yeah either it either it you know <laughs> confrontation comes back and gets merged with wrath of kings somehow and the two can just coexist uh or wrath of kings just grows to the point where it's in my mind able to fill that void that confrontation left i got time for one more Gekillian asks, if you're going to design your own game and line of miniatures, what thematic settings and aesthetics would you choose for the world in the first two factions? Also, great content. Cheers. Um, ah, see, that's a hard one because I'm very, I'm very passionate about the idea that it's, it's hard these days to make original miniature lines. And you see there's so many companies right now that are trying to copy what other companies are doing and I think struggling because the world doesn't need another steampunk game. The world doesn't need another... Um, you know, like gothic horror game. The world doesn't probably need another 40k clone. Um, it doesn't need a new, another like, you know, sharp future combat game. 
Uh, so what would I do? Well, I try and do a niche that isn't currently being served mainstream. The problem is that my favorite niche is stuff like post-apocalypse, and while it's it's not really being served mainstream right now, it's being served in other mainstream tabletop areas. So like, to do a zombie miniature game like I'd like to do, Zombie Side's already there. <laughs> it's already doing it. And people are already playing Zombie Side and owning Zombie Side miniatures. So like, to do like zombies and human survivors, that's that already exists. Um, so I don't really know. I mean, I don't know what, I mean, if I had that unique and cool idea, then I'd probably be doing it. I don't really have that cool, unique idea though. Uh, if I was gonna do it purely based on vanity or like what I like, hmm. just like just like themes and things that, that already grabbed me that I think would be cool to do a miniature game on. Uh, I talked a little bit about Bioshock gaming. Like, that'd be cool. If I could license Bioshock somehow and do a like objectivist like, you know, set of models, and I would just do splicers and survivors, like the people that are surviving down there in Rapture, or not even survivors, but like salvagers, you know, people that have come down to basically try and salvage what they can from Rapture, and like steal its technology, and like, you know, basically do what Atlas is doing, and try and like, you know, get get their piece of Andrew Ryan's dream while they can before the whole thing goes like to the bottom of the ocean, and then the other side just be slicers, like these like messed up like dock workers and people that are overly spliced and have just turned into like cannibals and are living in the underbelly of Rapture, and then you can just do expansions because the cool thing that they did with um, the whole sort of universe of. Bioshock was because the second se the second the second of those like series or sorry the third of those series of games the one that took it out of Rapture was about parallel universes and um, you know uh, Christ of Infinite Earths you you could do like you could just basically bring that in you you bring in the whole idea of like the portals and uh, Comstock's what you call it Comstock's uh, uh, I can't remember what his city's called but Comstock's floating city in the clouds and the Latuses, and you could do this like uh, parallel universe dimension where new 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 groups are basically entering Rapture, and the groups from Rapture are entering this new setting, which is this flying city, uh, and they're doing battle because, you know, they're at odds or whatever their agendas are basically that you come up with. And you could do cool minis, and you could do like um, lots of cool NPC minis too, like you could do like Little Sisters and Big Daddies, you could do Handymen, um, and stuff that like, there's like a random event, you know what I mean? Like water starts spilling into the thing, or <clears throat> the um, platform you're fighting on starts collapsing. It'd be very cool to do a, a floating table where, you know, all these platforms are basically floating. If you fall off and you die, I think that'd be super cool. But like I said, you know, it would be some kind of license like that. But really, I mean, does the world, you actually be trying to pull from that license. Does the world need another like, uh, turn of the century, steam, horror, like whatever game? Probably not. I don't think it actually needs that. I think it's just be because I think it's cool <laughs> that we would do it. Um, all right, so there we go. I think I'm done. Uh, I still got some pain to do on these guys, but I hope you enjoyed this piece of ash for June. Uh, I'll be back for more piece of ash in July. So if you want to get your question in, click the link below right now in the description for this video. Um, and I will try and get to as many questions as humanly possible. I got to about 31 this time, which isn't too bad, rambling on. Um, and I will uh, talk to you guys later. So thanks again for watching. I hope you enjoyed sitting at the painting table and watching me paint some Depleted and Mr. Tannen. Uh, I'll post some pictures on my Facebook page later today when they're done. We'll see you for more Piece of Ash. Until then, happy